Welcome to Half History Real Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and this video may seem a little strange at first, but when I lecture or teach, I always stress that the historical people I highlight are people, meaning they have wants and desires, they have faults, they find love, they fall out of love. These people are human. However, when it comes to Civil War generals, we mostly focus on their wartime exploits. But as I said before, they are still human. Thomas Jonathan Jackson was a loving husband, and to highlight his humanity in that aspect, I thought reading extracts from some of his letters to his wife would help understand the man himself. His first wife, Ellie, passed away after a little over a year of marriage during childbirth in 1854. He would be 1857 before he married again. Thomas and Marianna had a happy home life, and although their first child died from jaundice at about a month old, Jackson did not despair. He turned toward his faith. The devoutly religious husband comforted his wife. Although he was known as a hard individual on the battlefield, these letters depict a loving man. April 25, 1857 It is a great comfort to me to know that although I am not with you, yet you are in the hands of one who will not permit any evil to come nigh you. What a consoling thought it is to know that we may with perfect confidence commit all our friends and Jesus to the care of our Heavenly Father with an assurance that all will be well with them. I have been sorely disappointed at not hearing from you this morning, but these disappointments are all designed for our good. In my daily walks I think much of you. I love to stroll abroad after the labors of the day are over and indulge in feelings of gratitude to God for all the sources of natural beauty with which he has adorned the earth. Sometimes since, my morning walks were rendered very delightful by the singing of birds. The morning caroling of the birds and their sweet notes in the evening awakened me in devotional feelings of praise and thanksgiving, though very different in their nature. In the morning, all animated nature, man excepted, appears to join in expressions of gratitude to God. In the evening, all is hushing in a silent slumber and thus disposes the mind to meditation. And as my mind dwells on you, I love to give it a devotional turn by thinking of you as a gift from our Heavenly Father. March 1859 I got home last night in as good a health as when I gave my darling the last kiss. Hetty and Amy came to the door when I rang, but would not open until I gave my name. They made such a do about not bringing you home. Your husband has a sad heart. Our house looks so deserted without my esposa. Home is not home without my little dove. I love to talk to you, little one, as though you were here, and tell you how much I love you, but that will not give you the news. During our absence, the servants appear to have been faithful, and I am well pleased with the manner in which they discharge their duties. George came to me today saying he had filled all the wood boxes and asked permission to go fishing, which was granted. You must be cheerful and happy, remembering that you are somebody's sunshine. April 27, 1859 All your fruit trees are yielding fruit this year. When George brought home your cow this morning, she was accompanied by one fine little representative of his sire, and it would do your heart good to see your big cow and it little calf, and to see what a fine prospect there is for an abundant supply of milk. Heretofore I have been behind Captain Hayden's calendar for gardening, which he wrote out for me, but this day brings me up with it, and I hope thereafter to follow it closely. I have arranged under each month its program for the different days, so I have but to look at the days of the month and follow its direction. April 22, 1861 My little darling, the command left Stanton on special train at about a quarter past ten this morning. We are now stopping for a short time on the eastern slope of the Blue Ridge. The train will hardly reach Richmond before night. The war spirit is here as well as at other points on the line and is intense. The cars had scarcely stopped before a request was made that I would leave a cadet to a drill at company. April 23, 1861, Richmond, Virginia. The cadets are camped on the fairgrounds, which is about a mile and a half out of the city on the left side of the road. We have excellent quarters. Colonel Robert E. Lee of the Army is here and has been made Major General. This I regard as of more value to us 
and to have General Scott as commander. As it is understood that General Lee is to be our commander-in-chief, and I regard him as a better officer than General Scott. So far as we hear, God is crowning our cause with success. But I don't wish to send rumors to you. I will try to give facts as they become known, though I may not have time to write more than a line or so. The governor and others holding the responsible offices have not enough time for their duties. They are so enormous at this date. July 1861, Winchester, Virginia. It was your husband that did so much mischief in Martinsburg. To destroy so many fine locomotives, cars, and railroad property was a sad work, but I had my orders and my duty was to obey. If the cost of the property could only have been expended in disseminating the gospel of the Prince of Peace, how much good might have been expected. You must not be concerned at our falling back to this place. One of the most trying things here is the loss of sleep. Last night I was awakened by a messenger from the house of a friend where some cavalry had stopped. One of his fair daughters took it into her head that the cavalry belonged to the enemy, whereupon she wrote me a note, much to my discomfort, but the field officer of the day went over to examine into case and found the officer in command was one of his friends. The people here are very kind, so much so that I have to decline many invitations to accept their hospitalities. At present I am in a very comfortable building, but we are destitute of furniture, except such things as we have been able to gather together. I am very thankful to our Heavenly Father for having given me such a fine brigade. This is just a portion of some of Stonewall Jackson's letters to his wife. I hope to read more to you in the future, but I hope this makes Stonewall Jackson more human for you, and not see him as simply a general on the battlefield. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time.